Our text is found in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9. This is part, however, of course, of the text that really goes back to verse 5 as the apostle addresses both servants and masters and wants both to hear what he has to say to the other. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, Paul has said in verse 5, not with eye service, but as servants of Christ, and then with goodwill doing service as to the Lord, not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free, and then any masters do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven. Neither is there respect of persons with him. These words come as a conclusion, as we pointed out a couple of weeks ago, come as a conclusion to a controlling declaration and exhortation that says in verse 18, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And then, having said that, the Apostle Paul makes plain that the Christian faith has something to say to every area of life. And there are biblical principles that are to be, to be applied to every area of life, which is, of course, something that uh, many, even as so-called Christians, aren't it interested in hearing. They're not interested in that brand of Christianity. They want to hear about a God who loves them all, who has a general approval of them all, no matter how they are living, and by whose wonderful benevolence they can be assured of going to heaven when they die. But don't preach to me a Christianity that has certain laws, ordinances, restrictions, if you please, on various aspects of my life. Sunday morning say some good things to me, but how I live my life during the rest of the week certainly is my business without having the word look over my shoulder and you trying to make me feel guilty about how I'm living my life in labor, in marriage, and all the other aspects. Understand that's not the biblical religion. That's not the apostolic brand of religion. The apostolic brand of religion is a word that has a Christ who is Lord of every area of life, whose servants we are, and he is our master, even as a servant, as a master, a slave in Paul's time, had a master that had something to say in every area of his life, every second of the day, if you will, a minute of his day, so it is with us and Christ. That's the apostolic religion, that's the Christian religion, and that's the truth, of course, the biblical truth that must be preached. But in the second place, there is that reference to the Spirit, and it's an interesting way that the apostle puts it, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, doesn't say may not drink any wine or alcohol, but don't be drunk. It may not be excess of wine or alcohol, but rather be filled with the Spirit. That's not only a contrast, there's a parallel to be filled with the Spirit rather than wine, because if you had a little too much wine, what's affected? Your walk and your speech. And you can tell a man has had a little too much wine. Well, beloved, men ought to be able to tell, not that we have a little too much Christianity, but that we do have the Spirit. It ought to see 
it ought to show in our walk and in our speech where we won't walk to and go to and where our feet do take us and what speech we will not engage and we refrain from but rather what we will talk about. Our Christianity better show in our walk and talk or our life denies what we say that we have the spirit of Christ. According to the text now there is also this matter of the spirit and his effect upon us has to do also with the labor, the area of field of labor, both as employees, as those who labor, and as employers, those who are owners of businesses. And having the spirit, then one who is a laborer ought to be able to show indeed that his Christianity makes a difference in how he goes about his labor, with what spirit, with what attitude, with what diligence, with what honesty, so that others indeed realize this is a man who is worth his wage, and we ought to have more like this for the sake of the, of the, of the business. Uh, good testimony concerning the difference that Christianity makes, and even how one goes about the common labor of the day, but also employers, one who owns a business, ought to be evident that one has the spirit of Christ. And the spirit of Christ, of course, will show itself in your attitude towards those who work for you. But there's also this. If one is an owner and one has a spirit, it will show itself in one's attitude concerning oneself, what such a man thinks about himself. I have a business, maybe I have wealth. What does that make me? How do I think about myself with respect to what I have? And then in regards to others. Well, one, one who is governed by the spirit of Christ, realizing he has been blessed by God, will have even in that a humble attitude, a grateful attitude, and not one who is lifted up in some kind of an arrogancy, but it's plainly evident that he is thankful to the Lord for what he has been given and knows that he too is under authority, under the authority of his Christ. And now, Lord, as I have what thou hast given to me, responsibility and authority, how shall I serve thee in such a way as to bear witness even in this matter concerning the Christian faith and perhaps even as an employer. I can make a good witness to those who labor for me and perhaps even be used in gaining others to Christ and how I as an employer go about my business and my attitude towards them and my attitude towards myself as others observe and read that. So here, a word to masters, a significant silence, a significant exhortation, and then a significant incentive. In this first point, we intend to deal with an issue that we raised a couple of weeks ago in connection with our consideration of the apostolic word to servants and slaves. That is, as I said back then, a little more in connection with the matter of what is known as the social gospel. Social gospel, of course, is the direction in which church after church in our day and age is drifting, drifting in the direction of the social gospel to the neglect of what is supposed to be her great task and purpose on this earth, namely 
the preaching of the apostolic gospel, which is the gospel of salvation and of grace. What belongs at the heart of the apostolic gospel, I think one could say this, what belongs at the heart of the apostolic gospel, that the church of Christ is to focus on is reconciliation, the word of reconciliation unto God. Be ye reconciled unto God. That's the word of a love for a neighbor that you call him to be reconciled unto God. He may not want to hear that word. That is plain from the words that you obviously think he needs yet to be reconciled unto God because he's living in a way of sin and he's walking in the way that puts him under wrath. He may be offended as he says by that. He's taking offense. You haven't given him offense. He's taking offense. That truth. But we preach reconciliation unto God lest you perish in the way. That's love. We're concerned about his eternal destiny and where he stands with God. And then the way the way that one is reconciled unto God. Christ Jesus crucified and risen from the dead. That's the great purpose and calling of the Christian church. Why God placed the church, the apostolic church in the world to bring that gospel of reconciliation unto all mankind that all might hear the way of reconciliation unto almighty God and where you stand then with God as you live. Social gospel lays that aside. Social gospel goes in the way of addressing all the ills and injustices of the present society and sees it as calling in time to address government and government agencies and how they ought to be governing their affa affairs and where they are failing to govern their affairs <coughs> properly. And then seek in, in reality, of course, to set at ease again and to set aright the relationship of man to man and men to men. That has set aside, in so doing, the real focus of her calling not where you stand with your fellow man and do you feel you have been wronged by your fellow man and let's get right how man has treated man. Where do you stand with God? I raise this issue of the social gospel and having some things to say about it and then the proper and true calling of the, of the church in our day and age because the matter is raised, you know, really by the text. Not so much in what the text says, but in what the text is silent concerning. And there is a conspicuous silence in the text that modern man would expect it to address, namely the rightness or the wrongness of the institution of slavery. Where is there in this passage that we read one rebuke of the apostle towards those who are masters and the command of the apostle and set free your slaves, set my people free, release you're slaves. If you are the master, you own slaves. You are a sinner. You are under condemnation, under the wrath of God. How can one man own another man as a piece of property? Set your slaves free. We as Christian church have come to change these various institutions of men. Not one word concerning that a conspicuous silence. And of course, as we noted a couple of weeks ago, the world and the worldlings and the unbelievers have seized upon this conspicuous silence in the apostolic wor word to justify their own dismissal of the Bible as any divinely inspired book, any book that comes how somehow to us from, from heavenly origins. If this was from heavenly origin, certainly there would be the condemnation of the institution of, of slavery and the command that every master set free his slaves if he claims to be a, a Christian. We are justified in rejecting Christianity 
that has a Bible that says nothing concerning the institution of, of slavery and setting every slave free. And criticism comes from within the church as well by unbelieving men who want to say they are justified in their selecting certain parts of the Bible to be the word of God, whereas others certainly cannot be the very word of God, or at least are time-bound and certainly claim that this word of the apostle in which he neglects to say something concerning the wrongness of the institution of, of slavery is proof that this is the opinion of a man. This can't be the very word of God. And so we can go through the Bible and decide which is culturally determined, what applied back then, and what no longer applies today. Here's one instance. Women in office, of course, would be another instance we can pick and choose, and they justify that because there's silences here that certainly ought not be if this was the word of God. The love we proceed by faith, as I have said back then, and this is, of course, the word of God. And the very silence here serves to teach us something. It, sees, it serves to teach us concerning the purpose and the calling of the church, what things it is that the church enters into and what the church as institute does not enter into. It can't be gainsaid that the scriptures do not condemn slavery as such. You don't find a word of it in the Old Testament. You have laws governing slavery, and you have laws that require those who own slaves to treat them with a certain care and with a certain liberal spirit, but you do not have the Old Testament condemning the institution of slavery, and you certainly don't find it in the New Testament either, either here or in Colossians, and we read Philemon, and obviously if there was ever an occasion for the apostle to condemn the institution of slavery, there would been, have been the occasion. He writes to a slave owner, Philemon. He addresses him as a brother. You would think perhaps he would prevail upon him. I have your slave. He's run away from you. I'm sending him back. But Philemon, you being a Christian, ought to set them all free. Not a word. Treat him as a brother. Welcome him. Do not be harsh with him, Philemon. Treat him in a Christian way. But not one word of setting Onesimus free. Why not? What becomes plain, beloved, from the silence of the scripture on the rightness or wrongness of the institution of slavery is that the Christian church was not placed by God in society nor had the gospel committed to her in order to change society and the order of society that the church finds the society in which she is, is living. The church is not ordained, instituted in order to be, if you will, a revolutionizing force within society itself. Though by bringing certain threats to bear, or certain words to bear, it would turn ungodly society, leaving it in its, really, its unbelief and ungodliness, a place where righteousness rules and a veritable kingdom of God. It's not the calling of the church. It's not why the church has been placed in the world, to be some kind of a revolutionary force in the altering of the relationships of the societies in which she finds herself and to right every wrong and to prevail against every injustice and to get the ungodly somehow to conform to the righteousness of God while their hearts have not yet even been changed. It's not the purpose of the, of the church. If that were the calling of the church, then certainly one of the first things the apostles would have done as they went throughout the Roman world, was to found, find opportunity to protest against the 
imp emperor of Rome and all the injustices that were being done by the authorities of the, uh, of the Roman Empire and those who governed because it was corrupt to the core, as you know, and injustices abounded. And yet, you don't read that the apostles said one word concerning those injustices or took it upon themselves to confront Caesar with his injustices and demand that he ceases injustices or there might be some kind of reprisals or who knows what kind of reaction in the empire. Rather, this word, as you know from Romans 13, let every soul be subject to the higher powers, for the higher powers that be are of God. So submit to these authorities in spite of their ungodliness, in spite of their injustices, in spite of their abuses. And if they wrong you, what are you to do? To suffer the wrong. To submit to that in a patient way without threatening, without threatening reprisals. But to do so as one who is a Christian and will yet recognize the authority as being from God. You find nothing of the apostles addressing these wrongs and saying to them, and if you do not cooperate and comply and start promoting uh, justice and what's right, there's going to be reprisals and upheaval in your society. I love that's not the calling of the church. The church has one great calling and has to do, of course, with the preaching of the gospel and pointing men to God and their relationship to God and to consider what God requires of one even in difficult circumstances, even in circumstances where one is being dealt with in an unjust, unjust and unfair manner. Would that be clearer? All you have to do is read a man like the Apostle Peter. We did that a couple of weeks ago, but I remind you what the Apostle Peter said to those who were being abused and mistreated by the powers that be. He says, I beseech thee as pilgrims and strangers to abstain from certain lusts and so on. And then it says, submit yourself to every ordinance of God and of man, and I beseech, and, and to suffer these wrongs. Servants be subject to your masters with fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. Suffering wrongfully, enduring grief with a good conscience toward God. What glory is it when you buffeted for your faults you suffer? But if you take it patiently as a Christian, this is acceptable with God. Even unto, here unto were ye called as Christ suffered his injustices. And so to reflect the very spirit of Christ in these matters. Understand in this way, the gospel, the Christian gospel, the apostolic gospel, differs from what we may call the social gospel. The gospel of Christ Jesus focuses on where one stands with God and what sins I have committed against God, what sins I have committed against my fellow man, and what I ought to refrain from as a Christian now lest I continue to sin against my fellow man. Lord, teach me how I am to behave in such a way that I do not sin against my fellow man, that I may refrain from doing that. Whereas the social gospel, of course, begins to talk about the wrongs that men do to men. And in time, of course, it sides with a certain segment of society in its, in its preaching and pointing out the the wrongs, and in times those who come under its preaching begin to reflect upon the wrongs that are done to, to me and, and to us, and how long must we endure these, these wrongs that are done to us, and so we must protest these things, and if they will not change these matters, and now there's not righteousness and justice in society, well, 
there's something perhaps we ought to do about it, rise up and do about it. We must become a revolutionizing force so that there's a, a righteousness in society with man with man. It's not the apostolic gospel, beloved. That's not what the ap- apostles went about doing, preaching something that would go to the, those who weren't happy with their circumstances, agitating them in their unhappiness, stirring them up, and now their unhappiness becomes a kind of threat to the powers that be. That was precisely what the apostles were at pains to command, exhort the Christians not to do so that the powers that be and the government and their agencies didn't look at the Christian faith as a threat to the peace of the, of the community, the peace of the, of the nation, agitators, stir-ups stir of, of troubles and, and unhappiness. It wasn't the concern, beloved, of the Christian church, simply man with man and writing all the injustices that man does with man. There's no end to the wrongs done. And if that's what the church begins to do, you ask yourself, what, lasti- what purpose has the church served of any lasting value Churches with numbers may bring a certain pressure to bear upon government agencies and they finally acquiesce because of the pressure brought to bear. Their hearts haven't changed. They're still the same men. Then you may know down the road when an opportunity arises, they're going to be right back at it again. They have a, the church will have accomplished nothing in the lasting, enduring way. The church that brings the gospel, now she has a purpose to serve. And she has something to bring to men. And what she accomplishes by the Spirit of God will be in a lasting and an enduring way. And then the great question that faces a man, how may I be one who bear witness to my Christian faith and show the difference that Christ has made in my life? And how may I find the grace to refrain from doing wrong to others and sinning against them. And that's the word that the apostle has brought to the slaves as he brought as he found them in troubling circumstances, to be sure. Now the slave must consider I'm a Christian. And now how do, do I show that I am a different man, that I have been converted, that Christ is in me? And how do I now refrain from sinning against my master. Beloved is to refrain from sinning against a master to rise up in a revolution against him, to refuse to serve him, to insist that he set me free, or else forbearing threatening. That doesn't only apply, beloved, to masters. That applies to servants, don't forget. Forbearing threatening. Do the same thing, and he refers to this forbearing threatening. He's already said to the servants by implication, forbear threatening. And you wonder why we take a stand against labor unions that allow for strikes. What is a labor union if it's not a threat by employees against the employer? You will either grant us our rights and what we require of you, demand of you, or there's going to be reprisals. Precisely contrary, beloved, to the spirit of this passage to forbear threatening not only masters but servants as well, lest in the way of threatening one does wrong to the other. Shows not love, seeking the other's well-being, but if need be I will injure you and lash out at you. So the Christian gospel comes. And it confronts a man in his circumstances with his calling to be reconciled unto God. And now to live in such a way that you refrain not only from sinning against God, but you refrain from sinning against your fellow man as well. Not simply all the injustices done to me, how I have been treated unfairly. And if nothing's done about it, perhaps I ought to take matters into my own hand to put things right. Don't forget the word of God. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. But as for you, as much as possible, live peaceably with all men. Slaves, servants, masters, impoverished, 
and others as well. And so the Christian has this calling in the name of Christ to show the world the difference his grace has made to give good service, not evil for evil, beloved, but good for evil. You have treated me in an evil way, in a harsh way, in an unfair way. I will not return the same. I have been transformed. I will do good to you. You require much, what, what of me as your servant or your slave? Then I will do so because my Lord requires that of me. And you ask how it is that a man can suffer these things. How can Christians suffer these things? This is not difficult for a, a man to be suffer injustices and wrong and, and not lash back and not take matters into his own hands so that there's justice. These injustices are, are taken care of. Yes it's, yes, it's difficult, but there's a, another principle that's at work in how a Christian walks in this society in difficult circumstances, be he impoverished, be he, and back then, a slave. I am a pilgrim and a stranger. This world is not my home, and I am not living here in order that I may here have full freedom and full prosperity and all of my, my rights. Rather, I look for my reward not here on earth. I look for my reward in heaven itself. And in waiting for that reward, I'm willing to suffer these things to prove here I am a pilgrim and a stranger, knowing full well that we cannot without the change of men's hearts, have righteousness on earth. There's only one way, beloved, of men doing the righteousness of God and obedience to God. They've heard the gospel. They've been transformed inwardly. Then they can go about in the way of keeping God's law and living according, it, according to it as they ought and trying, if they're in places of authority, to bring it to bear. But left in their ungodliness, in their unbelief, how in the world are they going to bring the righteousness of God to bear and exercise in futility? And so the church sticks with her task where she is faithful in the preaching of the gospel and be reconciled unto God and now walk in his ways and show the difference that Christ's grace has made. That's not to say, that's not to say that a Christian as a citizen of this land may not be involved in opposing abuses and evils and so on. The evil of abortion and speaking against the evil of abortion and petitioning against the evil of abortion or this new law that threatens the whole of our society, the legalization of the union of, homosexual, of homosexuals as now they have the right even to, to raise a family if you can believe it with your ears, and, and we have to, but to oppose that and to let our legislatures, congressmen, know how opposed we are to these things and the evil that it will bring upon society if this is passed as, as law. But we do so lawfully. We do so as the law permits us in the way of addressing congressmen and petitioning and so on not by taking the law in our own, our own hands and by threat saying, and if this is not put right, there will be reprisals. We will agitate, we will stir up others that will bring force to bear upon, upon you. Not how the apostles labored, beloved. Their focus was upon the gospel, being reconciled unto God. And as for the Christian, he might address these wrongs. But he did so always in a lawful way. And meantime, if as he did these things, he was opposed and abused and injustice was done to him, he bore it meekly, suffering these things, knowing in the end, my reward will be from Christ for my obedience. I do not look for my reward here on earth necessarily. That said, 
And though it's true, the church herself is silent with respect to many injustices in society as she focuses upon the gospel and the call to be reconciled unto God. It's not to say the church has nothing to say to those who are in power, who have been given authority. The church has something to say to them as well, not only to the slaves in their circumstances and the servants who serve with well-doing and then with the grace of, of submission, even bearing wrongs without lashing back. There's also something to say to masters. And it's a striking thing that it has here to say to, to masters. From a certain point of view, I use the word, this is revolutionary. This is a whole new perspective on humanity itself that the Gentile world knew little of. Namely, as I said a couple of weeks ago, that you had the Christian church addressing words to slaves as though they were real human persons with minds and understandings and souls and not simply pieces of property to be done with as a man would to be abused. As that one philosopher said, the one a slave is simply an animated tool as a tool is an inanimated slave. Very little difference. You can discard the one or the other when you see fit. Nothing of that. The apostle, in the hearing of the masters of the congregation, has addressed the slaves as being children of God and as being saints. And then no matter what their social status amongst the congregation, you know, the, back then you had the aristocratic level of society and you might say the the wealthy and the and the free and down here you had the servants and the slaves no matter what might be their social status in society in the church they were of equal spiritual value and importance of importance and value to god who is no respecter of persons, and then also to be of importance and value to you as masters. Look upon them as those also who were created in the image of God. And even if they have corrupted that image and perverted that image, yet have retained the faculty of human beings, and as they are converted, have had the image restored to them. And according to their humanity, having an importance and according to their salvation, having a value, the value of the blood of Christ himself. In other words, as he says to Philemon, he comes back to you, your slave, to be used by you, but you better view him as a brother in Christ, as one who is important to you and whose well-being is precious to you, as precious to you as his well-being is precious to me and to my Lord and your Lord, don't forget the very way in which the Christian church addressed these slaves, neither bond nor free, neither rich nor poor, all having standing before God as to their value and importance, as I said, is, from a certain point of view, revolutionary, which is different than saying that the church now begins to try to revolutionize society but addresses each to whom the gospel comes to behave in a certain way before the face of God that you may bear witness to your own Christianity and refrain from doing wrong and sinning against others. And in that connection then, the apostle says to the masters, do the same things unto them for bearing threatening, do the same things unto them. What same things? From a certain point of view, he's speaking about obedience. The slaves, as he has said right at the outset, be obedient to them that are your masters. Now, he's not saying here, of course, to the masters, and now you must obey your slaves. That would amount to, of course, setting the slaves free. And he does not require that of the masters that they set their slaves free. But still, the same thing is required of you, masters, and obedience. The servants, your slaves, are 
required to be obedient to my word. And you also as masters are required to be obedient to be obedient to the word of God and to recognize you too have a master. They have two masters, you and the Lord. But you also have a master and you must recognize that and to him you're going to give account. And he will deal with you according to how you have dealt with this slave of yours, this servant of yours. Have you dealt in a threatening, harsh way? Or you have dealt in a Christian and a liberal way, in a way that has to do with care and consideration. He speaks here of forbearing threatening, because, of course, that has to do with, I have said, dealing with a slave in a harsh way. And to get the most out of that slave, and even to work him to exhaustion to, and beyond his capacity, one would threaten with the whip. But one might even go beyond the whip, you know. And if you do not say, as I have commanded you, you who are single are going to be sold to someone else, who is even crueler than me, perhaps to the salt mines, which is going to mean your death within a few months, as every man knows. Or if you're married, I may sell your wife. Or I may sell your children, or sell you, so you're separated from your wife and and child, to push one to one's limit to take advantage of the relationship in a harsh way with the threats. And if you do not do as I say, these are the repercussions. The apostle says, as a Christian, nothing of that, to take advantage of one who is dependent upon you, not only back then, but even today. You need this job. I'll take advantage of that. I'll give you as little as I can. I'll work you as many hours as I can because I know, and you know, if you don't have this job, how are you going to feed your family? And so one hires those whom, of whom he can take advantage for his own advantage. The Christian master, the Christian employer must have nothing of that. Rather, he says, one must have the spirit of, of doing good. That's what he has just said, with good will doing service. And then verse 8, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same he shall receive the Lord, do the same thing. As the slave is to do good and serve your well-being by labor, so you are to do him good and serve his well-being by taking care of him and reimbursing him for his labor. Now back then, of course, they reimbursed their servants by for the labor by food and by clothing and by by shelter and by warmth and so on. And the apostle says, that's your calling today. The employer, Christian employer, has the, the same calling. He has to know the needs of those who labor for, for him. And then he's thinking of their well-being, not simply so they can scarcely get by. Is that how our Lord treats us? Gives us just enough so we can scarcely get by? and takes advantage of our dependency upon him and works us to the utmost limit. No, there is a benevolence, there is a generosity to our Lord and what he, he gives us, reimburses us for our labor, for our good works, if you, if you will, a generosity, benevolence beyond telling. And so the Christian employer, he knows the needs of those who labor for him their livelihood, and then there's tuition as well if they be believers and are sending their children to the Christian school. And the Christian employer is concerned about that because these are those who have been entrusted to his care, his oversight, if you will. And now he's called as a master to serve their best interests, even as Christ, our Lord, has served our best interest, and so represents his Lord. And so he looks at those who work for him, and he knows those who work for them, him, and as much as possible, those who work for him know he has their care, their well-being in mind as well. Not just what profit a worker can be to him, but this business of mine to support you and your needs as well. And don't think Workers, employees, don't know that, don't observe that, don't conclude these things. Here's one 
who isn't just interested in himself and his own profit, but he's also interested in us as those who labor for him and giving us fair reimbursement and our, our well-being and so on. They know. And when one is characterized by that, that's a good and excellent testimony. So it strikes me, you know, that the world knows this is, has to do with employ, employ, employees. The world knows how the Christians work and that it's a good thing to have Christian laborers with the proper attitude. It always strikes me, you go back to the, to the scriptures, how many ungodly men of power had believing stewards. Pharaoh had a believing steward, of course. Joseph, to his own prophet. You have the King Nebuchadnezzar that kept Daniel close to hand and Darius who kept Daniel close to hand and then uh, Artaxerxes who kept Nehemiah close to hand and the outstanding example to my mind is always Ahab. Who was the chief steward of Ahab's house? One named Obadiah who was a believer. Don't think Ahab didn't know Obadiah was a believer. He knew he was a believer but he knew that having a believer as the steward of his house, the chief steward overseeing his possessions was the best thing he could have, an honest man, not, not, li not like those Baal worshippers who would probably steal him blind and give little in return. No, no, let's have Christians work for us with their attitude, with their work ethic, with their honesty, and so with employers. They know those who work. This is a man who's governed by Christian principles and has our well-being in mind. And that's a good testimony, beloved, to the faith that a man has and the Lord whom one confesses. Incentive, well, on the one hand, of course, there could be, could be warning, and there is that. There's no respect of persons. Your master also is in heaven. He's watching. He's assessing. He will hold one accountable, and he will meet out a just recompense of the reward and he's not one who respects persons dealing one way with those who are of an upper social level and another way with those who have a lower social level as they account it. Think of Christ himself of whom Christ mixed with, walked with and loved no respecter of persons or social status, that's for sure. But this is the great incentive. It's not just negative and a, and a warning. It's positive, beloved, as well. And the real incentive is that at the end of one's days, one stands before his Lord, and the Lord Christ says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant thou hast been faithful in little and I will reward you with much enter into the joy of your reward but I can think of no better words with which to conclude beloved than from Matthew chapter 25 on the judgment day when Christ stands in the judgment and then hands out his justice when the son of man comes in his glory and all the Gentiles all the nations are gathered before him and the he separates them as sheep from goats. And then he says to those on his right hand, Come, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. When I was hungered, you gave me food, meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me. And naked, you clothed me. Sick, you visited me. Prison, you came to me. And the righteous say, Lord, when saw we hungered, fed, fed thee, when thirsty, and gave thee drink, a stranger, and took thee, and naked, and clothed thee? King shall answer, Verily I say to you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of these, the least of my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Love the love, the love of Christ's own, as we love him, and we know we are loved by him, and how generous and benevolent he is to our every care. Thanks be to God for such a Lord, and when we have authority, we are called to reflect it. Amen. Father in heaven, for thy word we give thee thanks for having Christ Jesus himself as our Lord, who is the Lord of grace, but also the great example may we follow after 
emulate him and show indeed the work of grace in our hearts by how we live and walk and talk and treat one with another. In Jesus' name, amen.